Some 5,000 years ago, the people of the Orkney Islands began building extraordinary monuments out of stone. Each of the four principal sites, the stones of Stenas, the Ring of Brodka, Maze Howe and the village of Scar of Bray, are a masterpiece of Neolithic design and construction in themselves. But together, they represent one of the richest surviving Neolithic landscapes in Western Europe. The series of important domestic and ritual monuments gives us an incredible insight into the society, the skills and beliefs of these people who built these monuments. However, our understanding of the first civilization in Europe and Britain is only partially understood with huge holes in our knowledge, such as the actual use of their monuments. And when I say first civilization, I'm using it in its true meaning. I'm not dissing the original Mesolithic inhabitants, the hunter-gatherers, who had a culture, but did not build civil centres. They, after all, were mainly nomadic. In attempting to understand the purpose of the First Farmers Monument building, there's no better place to start than in the present. One's first impression of the islands of Orkney is they are quite different to how you imagine this part of Scotland should look. It's low, lush and fertile. It's on the same sandstone rock as the northeast tip of Scotland, Caithness, yet whilst the mainland does have some productive farms and its own Neolithic monuments, it is a little more wild. This is in part due to Orkneys being islands. Surrounded by the seas, they are warmed by the Gulf Stream. The climate is mild and wet, and in winter the temperature rarely drops below freezing, whereas if we travel south along the east coast, sub-zero conditions are more frequent in winter months with colder winters occurring in Edinburgh and further south. The Hebrides, with a similar climate, but more mountainous terrain, has a far greater land area. Skye, for instance, is over a third bigger, but the whole of the Inner Hebrides, some 35 inhabited islands, has a smaller population than that of Orkney. The combination of low terrain, fertile soils, mild climate and seas abundant with life makes this an idyll and it's been able to support a large population. There are currently 22,000 Orcadians, with most living on the main island, and that population was similar a hundred years ago, and we may suspect pretty consistent over the centuries. A thousand years ago, the Vikings colonised these islands for its fertility, and a millennium before them, the Celts, who built distinctive towers, or Brocks, which on this occasion were expanded into a small village in Pictish times, made Orkney their home. These people were not barbarians living on the edge of the known world, but a cultured civilization that appears to have specialists, like the Brock architects and builders, which we know from the fact building techniques and styles are shared between Brocks across Scotland, and meant these specialists were contracted out to do the building. Whilst they could have been fortified dwellings in a violent society, it seems more likely they were built to impress, a monumental marker in the landscape, highlighting the owner's social status, wealth and power, although we don't know if they were the homes of ruling families or collective tribes. At least 50 brocks have been identified on Orkney, and there are numerous unexcavated mounds that suggest more. Shakespeare's words may fit Orkney better than England. Earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm. 
Orkney is special. It certainly attracts visitors to return and some to stay, although the lack of trees means it's not to everyone's taste. And what was true now was true 5,700 years ago. Orkney represents the most northerly advance of Neolithic farmers, the first civilization. So who were these migrating farmers and how did they end up here in Orkney? Originally they were from around Turkey and Syria. Farming was invented over 10,000 years ago. They first collected wild wheat and then learnt to plant seeds near their homes for convenience and also learning to keep the bigger seed rather than eat them to plant for next year's harvest. So creating Emma wheat. They bred other plants and domesticated the cow, sheep and pig again using selective breeding to increase milk for cows and sheep, improve the wool and eliminate the more dangerous wild traits of the animal. As populations grew because food was more abundant, so new lands were sought out to settle. This was over a generational time period, over 3000 years before they expanded to the far north. The earliest settlers spread along the Danube and along the Mediterranean coast. And these two different migrations met a couple of thousand years later around Brittany, by which time they'd really gone into big megalithic structures, as seen by these pictures I took a few years ago, and it appears that here is where the practice started, around 7,000 years ago. The seafaring tribes settled in Cornwall. You can imagine them in their solid oak narrow rowboats, paddling their way up this estuary in Cornwall, at Lew, past heavily forest valleys, on their journey to more suitable lands. They were looking for lighter soils and less dense forest. Here near Liscard, they built a dolmen, their distinctive burial tombs, that were most likely covered under a mound, with the top stone originally being horizontal. as well as stone circles at Minions. These date from the late Neolithic. Others went on to Wales and Ireland, and along the west coast up to Orkney and the rest of Scotland. And we may presume the migrants were whose ancestors with less seafaring experience and boat building skills that came up through Central Europe, hopped over the Channel and colonised England. Of course, they were not stepping into a wilderness. Britain had natives, who were hunter-gatherers and had migrated north as the glaciers retreated. And DNA has demonstrated that they tended to keep themselves to themselves when the new colonizers arrived. And it also reveals they look different with dark skin and blue or green eyes. Like this reconstruction of Cheddar Man found in Cheddar Gorge, it appears he suffered an injury and crawled into one of the caves only to die of his wounds. The first Britons, like Cheddar Man, had lived a semi-nomadic life for many thousands of years before the first light-skinned Mediterranean-looking immigrants stepped on these shores, and travelled widely even up to the Scottish Islands. It's difficult to get one's head around the timescales involved. It was generational, and when a community had spent years felling forests, cultivating land, and seeing the population boom, pioneers would head further west and north and set up a new colony. It appears they leapfrogged the first colonists from the village travelling many miles into virgin territory, and when they became established, their descendants would head back towards the old colony to fill in the gap, as well as continue into new territory, although dolmen monuments from Cornwall to Orkney were constructed in, in a similar time frame between 5,700 and 5,500 years ago. It's been speculated that megaliths are a claim to the land, and that seems logical. The effort to clear forest, to build farms whilst maintaining the house of the clan, as well as the cattle, pigs and sheep, and most importantly ensuring fertility, lots of fertility with both humans and animals, babies meant success, that all of this deserved a recognition of the community's success. The monuments we see are evidence of their prosperity. These are the works of well-organised communities, with time on their hands, and the fact that they were able to grow and expand 
is testament to the skills as farmers and their ability to pass on information and knowledge, but also learn. A subject often overlooked when discussing Neolithic Britons is actual farming. There's a tendency to go all dewy-eyed and awestruck by the monuments and imposing on them a set of values. The musician and modern antiquarian Julian Cope offers a cosmic interpretation. I think what you've got at Callanish is a love of ritual taken to an obsessive level. I think the sites have such a relationship with rock and roll because the sites were places where people came for their theatre, where they came to dance, where they came for their drama, to bring drama in and to make them feel taller, to make them feel better about themselves. They were agriculturists. They maybe sometimes their harvest had failed, but when they came to the site, you know, there would be uh, there would be a sense of, hey, we've achieved this, we've achieved these the building of these huge stones. But even Time Team's expert in prehistory, Francis Pryor, is happy to do a lot of expounding. These sites are often about death. And death and the ancestors. The world of the ancestors obviously doesn't exist. But in their minds it did. And the ancestors were in league with something bigger and something more powerful. So by linking yourself to heroic figures in the past, you were linking yourself into God. The term Neolithic or New Stone Age is not a good description and does us no favours. It denotes a transition after the previous 300,000 years of hunter-gatherer to modern humans based on agriculture. The other ages of bronze and iron tell us only of the dominant material for tool making and little about their culture. The Neolithic was a time when scientific understanding and progress really came into its own. And farming is a science. The first farmers domesticated sheep, pigs and cattle, and in the early days they were perhaps more aware of the traits they wanted and the ones they did not, mainly the wild elements. So they would have bred accordingly, wanting faster growing, docile but reasonably tough animals. They invented animal husbandry, they wanted more female animals than male, and breeding males, like the bulls, boars and rams, would have been highly prized, just as they are now. Likewise, a pedigree line of cows, ewes and sows would be of great importance. Pigs could be kept in mixed herds, the dominant male naturally suppressing the male hormones of the other boars. These are ones I kept to look into researching their effectiveness in natural management and clearance in woodlands. Pigs make for great pioneering animals for farmers. They work very well in the initial years of setting up a colony, helping to clear the land, the sows having large litters of up to six piglets, when compared to sheep and cows that will have only one offspring a year, and they also provide a food source. In later Neolithic times, when communities have been more established for over a hundred years, we see a decline in their numbers. I did wonder about the technical issue of moving a herd of animals to a new colony using relatively small boats, but the obvious solution pointed out to me is that the colonists most likely would set out with piglets, lambs and calves, rather than fully grown animals. Cattle had an important role as traction, as draft animals that pulled perhaps the ploughs and carts, and possibly stones to the site of a new stone circle. Modern Greek creations of megalithic building have teams of men, but it seems a bit daft not to use the trained team of cattle to do the job. Research suggests that utilising the power of oxen was a very early development. Castrated cattle are also evident. Their bone structure is different to cows and bulls, although cows are as good as bullocks as draft animals. The herds were primarily cows, at least six to one bull ratio, with milk being a major product. And these farmers had the skills to make yogurt and cheese. And these were managed with calves being removed at six months to increase milk production and being culled in that year. In the later part of the Neolithic period, a new breed of smaller cattle were introduced from the continent. 
and more smaller cows produce more milk than fewer bigger ones. Sheep produce wool and milk and meat, yet in many sites they only make up a quarter or less of the animal bones, indicating that cattle were the dominant animal on these farms. Neolithic sheep were smaller than current breeds, and similar perhaps to the soya breed of Scotland that can feed on seaweed, although their distant ancestors appear to have been more hairy than woolly, spinning rather than felt making becoming more prolific in the later Neolithic and early Bronze Age when breeding developed woollier sheep. And it seems that a few goats were also kept. This practice of having one smart leader in a herd of sheep is carried on today, and the king or queen of the sheep being allowed to grow to old age. A skeleton of an elderly goat was buried in an early Bronze Age barrow at Twyford Down in southern England. Of dogs, they were quite big, and it appears that they were valued as pets, as there are burials. There is some evidence for the horse, but it's unknown if these were domesticated or remnants of the wild population. It's only in the Bronze Age that we see widespread distribution of domesticated horses. In the modern era, Orcadian farmers supplemented their domestic diet with fish and birds, and it seems that was the case in Neolithic times. There are also deer bones in small numbers, indicating that they were occasionally hunted. The main value was antlers for picks and raw materials, but these shed naturally, and the buckskin for clothing appears to have been more desirable, possibly even fashionable. This passing interest and need for hunting is reflected in the bow, with the Neolithic bow being less powerful than that of the Mesolithic. Farmers quickly learnt that inbreeding was a huge threat to survival. Not so noticeable in humans, as generations can be a couple of decades apart, but with animals that are giving birth once a year and able to sexually mature the following year, it becomes quickly apparent you cannot put the boar, bull or ram to his offspring, given the serious impact it has on the health and vigour of subsequent offsprings. This has a number of ramifications. When sending out a new party to colonise virgin territory, it would be essential for their survival to make sure the lambs, piglets and calves were from the very best pedigrees, and that the boars, bulls and rams came from a distant community, and that in the future there was a means to bring fresh blood to maintain the community's health. Archaeological research and the village of Scarabray point to another implication when it comes to fresh blood. The village is early Neolithic. It was revealed when a storm shifted the sand dunes in 1850, reversing the burial of the village 4,000 years earlier. Something noticeable is just how fine the dry stone walling is. This is beyond necessity and showing off a real pride in doing a job properly. There are two beds, a larger and a smaller one, with posts like a four-poster bed. There is a fire and a cooking area in the middle, stone storage, and a dresser to show off treasured household possessions. The layout is found in Europe's oldest house on the Orkney island of Papawestre, and it's presumed the smaller bed is for the woman of the house and the larger one for the man. A comfortable bed of soft eider down and a fabric or felt curtain and a shelf for her crafted jewellery. And through this little doorway, the luxury of an ensuite loo, flushed out by the tides for when she needed to pee on a long, dark winter's night. Something very revealing are the clues to the mobility of women. These come from the ratio of strontium isotopes in their teeth, which reflects their dietary history, and from the constant influx of outside artistic influences into farming communities, as evinced by their pottery. You could speculate that the first farmers were very aware of the importance of fresh blood. It's an issue nomadic folk really had to deal with. And I can imagine young male colonists setting out perhaps with an elder for advice to carve out pastures new, clearing the land, establishing the community, and then seeking to attract women from far and wide. Traditional thinking is that women were little more than chattels, baby makers who could have more children if the children were quickly weaned onto cows or ewes milk, who slaved away grinding grain whilst the men sat around setting up priesthoods in their grand temples. Yet the practicalities would determine that women had equal power, they travelled far and wide, and the competition would be between communities in who could offer the most comfort and security. If the colony wasn't up to much, 
there would be another community who would want a fertile, healthy and talented young woman. And perhaps, as an added bonus, she had brought the very best bull calf from her community. The crafts, which are not exclusively women's work, are extraordinary. Orkney and Abenuncia have unique objects, strange carved balls the size of cricket balls. We have no idea of their use or function, but they do express platonic solids, three-dimensional forms of the triangle, square or pentagram. The later Greeks were fascinated by platonic solids, and even Johann Kepler in 1600 imagined the solar system was arranged around the five platonic solids. Despite not discovering bronze working or iron, they were masters in the materials they did have, whether decorative stone or bone or wood or fabric. They could weave, and I think the big surprise is that they made elegant little buttons out of semi-precious stones like jet. We imagine them dressed in animal skins, but judging from their masonry and crafting work, why would they not want to look smart? And Scarabray also presented this little makeup bowl with remnants of red pigment. Looking our best has been a human obsession for thousands of years, and whilst Julian Cope's idea of Neolithic people being the first glam rockers may be poetic license, I am inclined to agree they would dress up for occasions. The tombs of Orkney, of which there are many, show no sign of male or female hierarchy. The remains in tombs across Britain and Ireland being mixed and often including animal bones, such as the skull of a cow or bull or pet dog. Whilst Orkney has many tombs, these do not account for the population that lived and died here over one and a half thousand years. They're a tiny fraction, so perhaps they were merely a transitional resting place. Perhaps they were tombs and memorials to the founders of the community, a house, a house of the ancestors, so they would always be at the heart of the community. We, we don't know. Maze Howe, at the centre of the mainland island, is exquisitely built, and a great deal of care went into its construction. And like other passageway tombs, it's aligned for the winter solstice sun to shine through to the central chamber. We are certain that monuments were aligned to celestial activities, the movement of the sun, the moon, and the tracking of the seasons. The first instinct is to attribute such interest in the calendar as to help with farming, knowing when to plant and harvest. However, you don't need an accurate calendar to plant and harvest. A frost may be late, or the season may be early, and likewise, you, your harvest is when the crop is ripe, not according to the moon. My initial reasoning for an accurate calendar is navigation. Much of Britain was heavily wooded, and travelling by boat was better than struggling across land. On the chalk downs of southern Britain, with few rivers, there were ancient tracks on high ground. The ridgeway that follows the ridge of the Chiltern Hills connecting communities and monuments like Wayland Smithy Longbarrow. Up in the highlands and islands, boating was a way of life even into modern times, and to navigate it helps know where you are. The simplest positioning finder is either the sun at midday or the pole star at night or dusk. The higher up the pole star, which is always in the north, determines how far north you are. How low it is to the horizon determines how far south you are. And the position of the sun at midday, in reverse, tells you much the same. We don't have any remains of a Neolithic boat, but we do have Bronze Age boats, expertly built with no nails, carved from slabs of oak and tied together with yew branches, and big enough for a group of perhaps 20 pioneers. And... Their baby livestock, tools, bows, spears, seeds, and their wits, as well as a couple of dogs. And a huge number of skills. Farming, building, tool making, animal husbandry, hunting, food preservation, navigation, brewing beer, and the community's knowledge. It really is astounding. They colonised the British Isles over a few generations, travelling miles away from the community they grew up in, it would be like us colonising an alien planet and packing everything we need in a spaceship with the knowledge of humanity with no support until we were established. And when they were established, the community was strong and numerous. They built their megaliths. And this is where you can let your imagination fill in the gaps. 
I'm sure they had every excuse to celebrate festivals, just as we do. To give thanks for a good harvest, to hope for a good harvest, to rejoice with the arrival of spring, and to mourn lost loved ones. Perhaps megaliths simply were a means to show off the success of the community. Perhaps the interest in the heavens was purely curiosity. An accurate calendar may be superfluous for good farming, but it's pretty essential if you want to have fixed events, fairs, where others can travel to exchange breeding animals for new blood or seeds or craft ideas, and where young adults get to meet other young adults. We take dates for granted, so possibly there was a Neolithic calendar widely shared, so you did turn up to party on the right weekend. Initially, I set out on this video to simply show off Orkney's rich Neolithic past, but I have been sidelined as usual, being drawn deeper into the subject, and it occurred to me a novel view of these stone circles. As explained, these people were first farmers, and extremely competent, and whose purpose was to go forth and multiply. Birth and fertility, the very basis of survival and success for the community. When it comes to animal husbandry, there are some challenges. Sheep like deer have a rutting season, they pretty well get on with it in the autumn, and five months later you have lots of lambs. You still have the challenge of ensuring the offspring don't breed with the father, of course. Cows and pigs can get pregnant pretty well any time of the year. They have a period of fertility of roughly three weeks. In the few days when mating can occur, you have to be careful. Firstly, not to miss that date, otherwise you miss a month. But also the threat of wild boars jumping the sow, leading to wild offspring, and also the danger of a horny boar rampaging through your farm. And likewise, cattle may attract wild aurochs very big and dangerous cattle, whose offspring would probably kill the mother during birth. And on top of this, you would not want newborns at the wrong time of the year. And for women, menstruation is a four-week period, if you didn't know, the word sharing its root with month and moon. Given many stone circles are aligned to the moon, and circles like Kalanash being records for the 18-year Grand Lunar Cycle, is it possible that the purpose of these monuments included being a pregnancy app. Far from being a sacred centre for men to act as wizards or priests, but a monument to fertility and to work out the best time for breeding for livestock, and a place for women to understand their own fertility. We know from research even today that to have a healthy population it's best to leave such important decisions of when to have children to the mother, not to men. You may wonder what happened to the first Britons. It seems from the genetic record they carried on doing what they had been doing for thousands of years. Some may have adopted some of the herding skills of the newcomers, but they didn't appear to interbreed, or settle down with farmers. They slipped into the woods. Perhaps a memory of them is preserved in folk memories of fairy folk and elves, with their powerful bows and habit of stealing babies. Eventually the habitat was destroyed and they vanished. Around 4,000 years ago, a new migrant turned up on Britain's shore, the bronze-using beaker people. Whereas the first farmers appear to have little or no conflict between each other, these newcomers came with swords. The study of bones would indicate they were a mass migration. A technically more advanced culture who came to dominate the Neolithic people. But bones are rare, particularly in Britain, and the ones we have come from high-value graves, like this archer in Aberdeenshire, and we see a change in burial practices, the communal burial mounds of the Neolithic people are abandoned, and the Beaker people, particularly men, having a single grave under a mound. And if they're the only bones you find, then it will give the impression of mass migration. And this is compounded by the recent revelation that Beaker people may have mummified their dead, including deliberately burying the bodies in peat bogs, so increasing the number of surviving skeletons. Nonetheless, something happened 4,000 years ago. Culturally, bronze and beaker people culture was widely adopted. On a genetic level, the Neolithic population is massively reduced, although many modern Britons have Syrian genes, although only as a fraction of our DNA. 
Now, this could be to do with the sample of Bronze Age bones and teeth excused in some way to the dominant new migrants. It could indicate a massive population collapse of the first farmers, caused by either natural disaster like climate change, pandemic or violence. In Orkney, the impact of the beaker culture appears to be far more diluted than elsewhere in Britain. It was considered that climate catastrophe crippled the community, but this has since been debunked, and if anything, the population appears to have increased. Only 20 bronze artefacts have been found across the island, spanning over a thousand years. Perhaps they simply valued them and later recycled them, rather than burying them with the dead or deposit them in a lake as offerings as they did elsewhere in Britain. And the old stone circles continue to have a role in their lives. Certainly there's a cluster of Bronze Age burials around the stone circles, and this continued into the Iron Age and the Age of the Brock, a need perhaps for them to connect to an already ancient landscape. In my next episode on Ancient Orkney, I'm going to go a step further into myth and legend and present Orkney as Plato's Atlantis. Cryptic or clickbait? Well, find out when that gets published and check for a link below. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, click the like button, subscribe, and if you've got an opinion about stone circles, leave them in the comments below.